Mitchell, for those who don't know me. Um, I know we're a pretty small town, but uh, you know, you never know. Uh, anyway, uh, we've had this wonderful opportunity to invite uh, Chuck Marone. He's a very friendly Minnesotan who has made his way all the way uh, here for literally two days. He presented in Delta last night. Volume! Volume! Volume? Ooh, that's better. Sorry. Uh, I don't speak on microphones very often. Uh, anyway, Chuck may, uh, has made it all the way to Canada from Minnesota here for two days. He was in Delta last night. Drove up here this morning, is presenting, and going back for a 7 a.m. flight out of Vancouver tomorrow morning. So we really appreciate him spending his time and coming here. Uh, I really appreciate all the sponsors, the folks who have helped us out. True Sue especially uh, came to the table right away when uh, we talked to them about this opportunity to bring a really sort of a uh, progressive and interesting thinker on Urban Matters Camlips, uh, and BCLC, the TRU Sustainability Office, uh, Brew Loops, and of course myself, Redbeard. If you didn't know that, uh, I'm also uh, Redbeard. And, uh, so, and Bright Eye, uh, <coughs> donated some beer for us, and then afterwards, we're going to have a little bit of a social at Red Collar. So, that's Red Collar, the one that's walking distance, not Red Beard, the one that's in North Shore. Uh, I don't know how many people follow Kamloops News, but not that long ago, there was this Twitter account called the Kamloops Radish, kind of making fun of Onion Style articles, and it said 87% of Kamloopsians don't know the difference between red beard and red collar. 100% correct. You have no idea how many dates have been by themselves at either or. We see it all the time. It's not so much anymore now that we've both been around for 10 years this October, but uh, yeah. Anyway. Uh, I have uh, Azel from uh, TrueSu, who's just going to come up uh, and say a couple words uh, on behalf of the Student Union. Uh, and then we have two videos from BCLC that we're just going to quickly watch. Uh, again, thanking them all for their support. And then uh, I'll say a few words to contextualize our conversation tonight. Uh, and then I'll give it away to Chuck. So it'll be about 60 minutes of talking. And then there'll be a Q&A afterwards where people can ask the questions. And then if you're into socializing, we will head on over to Recolor. So thank you all for coming. Good evening, everybody. I hope the volume is okay. You have to get it close to your Is this okay? Closer. Closer? There you okay. go. See that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so good evening, everyone. My name is Azul Sky Billy. I am the Vice President External with the TRU's Student Union. And uh, we represent roughly 10,000 students up at TRU. Um, and we're incredibly excited to be taking part of this, um, a part of this event, along with Mitch from Redbeard um, and other partners. Uh, so students and young people are an incredibly important part of this city. And often after graduation, those students decide to, you know, stay and make Kamloops their home. So um, we believe that they should have their voices included in planning for the future of our city. So having Chuck Marone here from Strong Towns to speak on transportation is really exciting. So it's our hopes that with this we can serve as a launching point for some really big and incredibly important changes here in Kamloops. So thanks to everyone for coming out and helping us think big for the future of Kamloops. Awesome. So thanks once again to our sponsors uh, for helping us out. And uh, I want to just spend three minutes contextualizing sort of our conversation here before Chuck starts. Uh, Many of you have probably come across my blog post at uh, Stronger Kamloops. Uh, maybe you even read the book I wrote back in 2012. Uh, maybe you just see me in the paper talking about something. Uh, I'm generally a little bit of a weird, crazy guy around town. And uh, a lot of what people say in here when they, when they see the things that I'm talking about is I often hear, well, that won't work. And these are the reasons why that won't work. And often, what I find is as we've transitioned in Kamloops from being a smaller place to being a larger city, is that we no longer have just one way of doing things. You know, when you're a, a town the size of Clearwater, what works for one area of town is what works for all of town. As we're getting bigger now, we have multiple neighborhood centers, we have multiple areas, and then they have different baggage that comes with them. 
my businesses that uh, I've set up and where I live is on the North Shore. Uh, we deal with our own set of problems over there. We have the highest residential property or population density in the city uh, on the North Shore. There's more people that are walking distance to Trunk Hill than anywhere else in town. But we have sort of challenges when it comes to creating walkable commercial for them along Trunk Hill. And a lot of that has to do with the way that different regulations and policies and investment and financial vehicles and developer risk appetite sort of come together to sort of make development in that area hard sometimes. What's happening downtown is a completely different set of criteria. We had a, a fantastic little one-on-one -on -one meeting with some of the city planners today. And we talked about how on the North Shore, you can try something totally crazy. Uh, when I started Redbeard, I was uh, 23 years old. We had no money, uh, and we took over the business from somebody else, and the landlord took a risk on us and said that was okay. I had tried to open a couple businesses downtown before that, and I always never found a landlord, basically, that was willing to hand over the keys to a commercial building to someone who's 23 years old. The risk appetite on the North Shore is totally different than downtown. Downtown, on the other hand, you know, we have a, a fantastic, vibrant Victoria Street. We have a lot of people who have been running like local institutional businesses that have been here for 60, 70 years. Uh, their voices are really important. They've built a lot of the foundation that makes downtown so great. But they have a different expectation of orderliness and predictableness that they want to see happen when you're talking about things happening downtown. We also have a third downtown, the university. It's got lots of people who live there, it's got lots of people who go to school there, who work there, and it generates its own set of criteria, mostly that it's you know this island unto itself that's not super well integrated into the rest of the city. So each area of town, we have different challenges, we have different goals, we have different opportunities. And so as we're listening to Chuck today, one of the things that I really want people to take away from this is that every street, every block, every neighborhood has different challenges, different opportunities, different outcomes. And so when you're thinking of, I, I remember one project I worked on recently was a workforce housing project uh, to help people who are working at a restaurant or working in retail who need a place to live. Uh, we got a big parking variance uh, in order to do that and council supported that and that was a fantastic move forward in trying to provide housing for people who are young and just entering the workforce. Huge win. Can't congratulate the city enough on making that happen. I remember reading the Facebook comments afterwards and somebody said, well, how are you going to get all the kids in the car and get to Costco when you don't have a parking stall? We're talking about 200 square foot studios for people who are 20 years old. They don't have two or three kids. They don't have a car. They live across the street from a transit stop. They walk to work because they're three blocks away. Their life situation is different than the person who's out living in Pineview who's just starting a family looking at a starter home that needs three bedrooms. Totally different life, totally different criteria, different things that they need. And so you might see something that Chuck talks about today and think, wow, what craziness is that? But maybe it's not so crazy when applied to Trunk Hill. Or maybe it's not so crazy when applied to Sixth Avenue. Or maybe not so crazy when applied to a different part of town. And so we need to start getting more sensitive, I think, as a city to contextualizing each of these conversations. We, don't, we can't apply one rule to the whole city because I'm 33 years old, I don't have kids, and I walk to work 90% of the time. Just because my neighbor doesn't, doesn't mean that you know, we're not equally valid in, in sort of the choices that we want to make in our lives. So therefore our neighborhood plans need to reflect that. So that's how I want to contextualize the conversation. And without further ado, I want to hand things over to Chuck for 60 minutes, and uh, thank you so much for making the trip. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> You're great. Um, hi. Hello. Oh, did it go out? Oh, I turned it off. Yeah, that wasn't... That's not as helpful. There we go. Hey, everybody. Um, thank you. Uh, the, you, this is just an extension of all the, the kindness and generosity that I've gotten uh, all day today. Um, I have to say, uh, we have a team at Strong Towns that works on putting together our events. Uh, we keep, they keep me on the road a lot, traveling different places. Uh, I attend the events meetings when I can, 
but I don't, I don't make all of them. Uh, there was one event that showed up on the calendar, uh, Kamloops. And I'm like, I gotta say, I have no clue where Kamloops is. <laughs> I'm from Minnesota, uh, Brainerd, Minnesota, center of the state. Um, I apologize, but I've never heard of Kamloops. I found out today that I actually wrote about Kamloops back in 2013, because uh, Mitch had published something that I picked up and, and I wrote about it. Uh, I jog my memory, I didn't remember this, now I do. Um, but I have to say, I asked the question a number of different times. Why are you sending me to Kamloops? Um, this seems a very remote place. What, what, what's going on? Um, I now understand. I now understand. Um, this is a wonderful place. It's very exciting. Uh, the people here are very interested in this conversation. Th this is a really great turnout. And I'm very excited to be here. I'm very humbled to be here. I uh, am humbled for doubting my team in any way. They know what they're doing. They know where to send us. Uh, basically, our uh, internal mantra is go uh, where we can help and go where the conversation is ripe uh, for a strong towns kind of talk. And so I'm here because they have faith in you. And uh, I guess having spent a day here, having met with your staff, having met with people around town, having had some great conversations with prospective council members and others, uh, I'm excited about this place as well. So thank you for being here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, you can applaud. <laughs> applaud. <laughs> um, I, I was asked to give essentially the same presentation I gave in Winnipeg when I was there like a month ago or two months ago, uh, which is, uh, you know, that would be okay. Um, that's what I was planning to do. I got here, I started having conversations. I'm like, I gotta do something completely different. So if you are disappointed because I'm not gonna do the Winnipeg presentation, it's online, you can go watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna do a presentation that has elements of that, but elements that I think are more uh, apropos to uh, the conversation we're having here. Um, for thousands of years across the world, uh, humans built their cities around a certain set of ideas. You can think of these ideas as evolving out of many, many, many uh, iterations of trial and error. Uh, across North America, we built uh, thousands and thousands of cities. And when we did, uh, they began their journey to becoming uh, places like Kamloops uh, like this. This is actually my hometown. This is Brainerd, Minnesota. Uh, it was founded in 1871. This photo was taken in 1871. This is the very uh, first iteration of my hometown. Thousands of cities like this never got beyond this point, right? They just, it, it wasn't the right people, the right place, the right time. These little bets just kind of went away. But a lot of places like this were successful. And when they were successful, they would grow in a way that we see repeated throughout history, really up until the, the post-World War II development era. Uh, this way can be described kind of like a culture growing in a petri dish, very organic, kind of complex process. The city would grow incrementally up, incrementally out, and incrementally thicken up and become more intense over time. And so after 30 years of growth in this pattern, uh, my little hometown, would look like this. This is the same exact street uh, in 1903, 1904, somewhere in that range. Uh, you'll notice that the buildings are more intense. Uh, they're now two and three story wood structures. As this city continued to grow, as more and more people moved to this place, uh, you continue to get that uh, organic growth, that pattern that would grow incrementally out, uh, incrementally up, and continue to thicken up and become more mature, more intense. So after another 40 years, these two and three story wood structures would become buildings of brick and granite. As I travel around your city, uh, I see the part and I experience the part today that has this historic pattern to it, right? Uh, because your city was founded in a similar way at a similar time uh, and grew and matured in a very similar way. Um, that ended and changed uh, in the 20th century. 
And I want to talk about this transition a little bit because it's central to the story of Kamloops. It's central to the story of my city of Brainerd. It's central to the story of North America. And it's, it's central to the story of a lot of the reasons why we struggle so much today. Uh, as we entered the Great Depression, um, there was a certain amount of tension and anxiety because no one really had a firm grasp of what was going on. Uh, you can today go read economists who describe the Great Depression and its causes. You'll read one economist and you'll, you'll, you'll finish the book and you'll say, wow, that, that was a really uh, informed explanation of what happened. And then you'll read another economist who will completely disagree with the first one and have a completely different explanation. And you'll read that one and you'll go, wow, that, that's very insightful as well. Nobody really understood at the time what caused the Great Depression. We don't agree on the causes today. Even more kind of disillusioning, nobody knew how to get out of it. In the U.S., the entire uh, New Deal project of Franklin Delano Roosevelt was an attempt to try many, many, many different things and see if something would get us out of this economic doldrums. Uh, what got us out of the Great Depression was, of course, what we're told in junior high, World War II, right? Which, think about that for a second. Uh, we have economic downturn. It, picture yourself as a bean counter, a, an economist in Washington, D.C., and you know nothing of human suffering. You know nothing of the human condition. All you care about is gross domestic product and whether it's going up or down. And all of a sudden, you have a decade where things are going sideways, going downwards, not working. And then all of a sudden, yay, everything's going up. This is not anyone's definition of prosperity, right? Millions of people dead, uh, rationing of, of, of essentials, uh, people shipped off overseas uh, to suffer. The, the, but yet, when we think about this as economists, this was fantastic, right? Because we got the economy going again. We're out of the Great Depression. As World War II was coming to an end, economists around the world got together and recognized that when we demobilized all these troops, when we brought everybody home, when we shut down all the industries of war, the factories that were building the tanks and the airplanes and the munitions, that nothing was fundamentally different about our economy than it was 10 years earlier. And the general impression that economists had was that we were going to just go right back into depression. As soon as we demobilize, as soon as we shut down these industries, bam, back to bread lines, back to 1935, back to high unemployment, because really, what had changed, right? What had changed? Nothing. Is that what happened? Of course not, right? What happened was something completely different. And I, I want to contextualize this for you because Today we live with the ramifications of this huge experiment. But at the time, this was a, 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 an incredibly logical undertaking. We have a, 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 a continent here in the US that at the end of the Great Depression, at the end of World War II, was largely unexploited, right? Huge amounts of wide open land. Uh, we had lots and lots of oil lots of coal, lots of ways to produce energy. Uh, we had uh, this brand new innovation that was now becoming part of the middle class, the automobile. And the automobile kind of carried with it the promise uh, of a continent of kind of independent-minded people, right? And we recognize that we had a culture, both here and in the US, that was united around fighting common enemies. Remember that, well, I'll say this here, and I, I, I think you will have some empathy. Uh, for those of you that remember 9-11, uh, if you look at the United States, what were our politicians doing at the time? People who hated each other the day before were locked arm in arm, singing songs, uh, hugging each other. We all felt like this sense of togetherness. Imagine going through that for four or five years straight together, right? We felt very bonded together. When you feel very bonded together, you'll undertake great, magnificent projects. And we undertook, we in the United States, you here in Canada at the same time, 
undertook this grand experiment to reshape a continent around a brand new concept of how humans should live. We turned our cities into kinetic growth machines, machines of growth, growth that would allow us to not only stay out of the Great Depression, but provide the highest standard of living that any human civilization has ever experienced. We came up with zoning standards. We came up with building standards. We came up with uh, street and road standards. We came up with infrastructure standards. We came up with ways to fund uh, all this expansion at the federal level, to subsidize private development, to subsidize homes, to subsidize infrastructure, to build, 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 so that we would not only stay out of depression, but experience this great broad prosperity. And here's the amazing thing. It worked, right? Uh, we look back at those two decades after World War II as this period of time uh, of intense prosperity. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something here. Uh, be generous with me, because uh, this is not a partisan statement. Um, you may know that uh, we occasionally have presidential elections. Um, we, yeah, I, I don't know how familiar you are with our system of government, but uh, we, have, we have a president, and the president election is every four years. Back in 2016, we had these two candidates. You may have heard of them. Uh, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Um, when I looked at the time at that election, and as I look back at that election today, what I see, what I saw, were two 70-year-old candidates selling to the American people the version of America that they identified as being the most prosperous. And the amazing thing about their visions is that they were talking about the same period of time, the two decades right after World War II. Whether that was a vision of make America great again, right? Ozzie and Harriet families and blue collar jobs. Or whether that was a vision of uh, an expansive federal government that could do big projects and take on big expansive things and be leaders. They were talking about the same two decades, those immediate decades after World War II. We nostalgize them today as this period of, of, of great prosperity where everything seemed possible. I want to show you what this looks like uh, from a city perspective. Because by turning cities into kinetic growth machines, we were able to create immense levels of prosperity and growth in the short term. But the long-term consequences of this, the consequences that we live with today, uh, were, if anything, an afterthought during this period of time. So this is a map of Fresno, California. I'm going to show you Fresno, California, not because uh, I think you are Fresno, California, but I think you will recognize your own story in the story that this map tells. I've just got really good maps of Fresno, so I can use it to tell the story. What you see in the yellow here is the boundary of Fresno. That's the city limits in 1897. Now, I want, to, I want you to watch how the boundary changes over time, right? So we're going to have this period of incremental growth prior to the end of World War II, where the city will grow incrementally up, incrementally out, and become incrementally more intense. Think of this culture growing in the Petri dish, right? We get to the middle of the Great Depression. We get to the end of World War II. And you can see that even during the Great Depression, even during World War II, uh, Fresno, California continued to grow outward. But at the same time, that development pattern I showed you from my hometown, where single-story buildings were replaced with two- and three-story buildings, and buildings became more intense and more innate. All that was going on. The city was kind of thickening up, becoming more mature over time. Now we're at the end of World War II. We don't want to go back into the Great Depression. We want our cities to be engines of growth, and so we turn them into kinetic growth machines. And here's what takes place. Uh, 1958, 1970, 1983, 1995, and then the last one here is from 2010. It, it's, the drive here from Vancouver was gorgeous, right? It's beautiful. 
I, I actually am going to admit something to you. Um, I have been to Calgary. Uh, I've been to Vancouver. I've not been in between the space between Calgary and Vancouver. My assumption was that when I got west, or, or I'm sorry, east of Vancouver, it would look a lot like Calgary. Um, so I came here with low expectations. Uh, I've been blown out of the water. This whole drive was beautiful. This whole day has been amazing. Um, when, uh, you know, when, when, when we look at your city, when we come into your city, uh, it is unavoidable to see this here, right? You don't have to be a geographer or a planner uh, or, 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 or really anyone uh, with a, any type of, of technical degree in land use uh, to recognize this pattern here, right? Um, again, this creates enormous amount of economic growth, right? Uh, but it also creates with it a, a lot of liabilities. I, I'm going to show you a, a couple things here uh, to kind of put that in context. This is data from a, a study that I was part of in Lafayette, Louisiana. And again, I'm showing you data that I have, not because I think you are identical to Lafayette, but I think Lafayette, Louisiana is instructive because it is very much like uh, every city that embarked on this suburban experiment post-World War II, their conditions are very similar to your conditions um, and conditions in, in, in my city. Uh, at the end of World War II, Lafayette, Louisiana was a little over 33,000 people. Today, it's a little over 120,000. It's grown by three and a half times. That is a substantial rate of growth, right? Yet when we look at Lafayette, we recognize that at the end of World War II, it took five feet of pipe per person to provide water, drinking water, to the people of Lafayette. Today, it takes 10 times that amount. At the end of World War II, it took 2.4 hydrants per thousand people to provide fire protection for the citizens of Lafayette, Louisiana. Today, it takes 21 times that amount. So when we look at this pattern of growth, what we can see very quickly is that the hyper-horizontal nature of it consumes a lot more public investment for each increment of growth. In a sense, we're getting less return. It takes more resource to add a person, to add a home, to continue to grow in this way. Now, you might be thinking in the back of your mind, well, okay, Chuck, that's fine, but I look back at the way people lived at the end of World War II, and my gosh, are we more prosperous today. We have bigger homes, we have more vehicles uh, per household, we have bigger yards, we have more stuff. We're just so much better off. Yeah, I hear you, I recognize that, but when we step back and we realize that, yes, our population grew very quickly, uh, but our liabilities grew even faster, we have to also take into account that our household incomes have only grown a tiny fraction of this. We grow our collective liabilities by 10 times and 20 times, but our household income hardly has grown at all. Our actual family net worth across North America has been trending downward for decades. In the US, 60% of our families have a negative net worth. That means they owe more than they actually have in assets. And this is after a time of decades of upward prosperity in a macro sense. This pattern of development is not building wealth for us. It is giving us short-term cash flow benefits in exchange for some enormous long-term liabilities. And before switching to transportation uh, and the transportation kind of aspect of this development pattern, I, I want to show you this map. Uh, there's a series of maps that we put together in Lafayette, Louisiana, looking at all the uh, sources of revenue that the city had, where their uh, utility fees were, where their property tax came from, where their sales tax came from. And then we looked at all the expenses that the city uh, incurred, all the, t all the expenses that the public was, in a sense, responsible for funding. Where's the road maintenance? Where's the water system maintenance? Where are the parks? Where's the police protection? Where's the fire protection going? And at the end of this project, we mashed all those maps together and came up with what, in a sense, is a profit and loss map for the city of Lafayette. 
every place where you see a blue property on this map uh, is a place where uh, that particular property is paying more in taxes and fees than they require in ongoing public services. And every place where you see red is the exact opposite. These are places that require more in long-term service and maintenance than they pay annually in taxes, right? The higher the, 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 the line goes, uh, the more that disparity is. So the really high blue ones are very profitable in a sense for the community as a community investment. The red ones, higher they go, are, 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 we're losing a, a lot of money. Um, let me point out what you're looking at here in Lafayette. In the middle of the city, this part that's blue right here, uh, this is their core downtown. They would kill to have your downtown. Uh, your downtown uh, has many parts that are struggling, many parts that are disappointments uh, because of the level of investment that's been made and what little you've received for that investment. But it also has some parts that are very spectacular and some parts that are on their way up. Lafayette would love to have your downtown. Their downtown in kind of a rundown, dilapidated state uh, is the most financially productive part of the city. There is a crescent of blue that runs through here. That crescent of blue uh, are the poorest neighborhoods in the city. These are the neighborhoods uh, that, uh, well, here, let me show you a picture. Um, this is the core downtown up on top. Uh, and then some of these poor neighborhoods that constitute uh, places that are paying more in taxes than they require in services. And let me be clear, you can look at this and see how run down and neglected this is. Our analysis assumes that the city will go out and fix the street and maintain the pipe and take care of the ditches and all this stuff. The fact that they're not doing that in reality makes the blue line higher. But if they were out taking care of things, these neighborhoods here are subsidizing all of this stuff out here. What's all this stuff out here? Uh, this stuff, right? The franchise restaurants, the gas stations, the big box stores, the strip malls, uh, the windy cul-de-sac-y streets uh, with the, the large lot homes. In Lafayette, Louisiana, and this is indicative of other places that we have studied, there's two subsidies going on. Subsidy number one, the poor neighborhoods are subsidizing the affluent neighborhoods. The core parts of town, the historic parts of town, are actually net outflows of cash to the outskirts of town, which are net inflows. This goes against standard conventional wisdom. We build that stuff because it generates free cash flow. It does generate free cash flow, in exchange for these enormous unpayable long-term liabilities. The net transfer is from in to the edge. Subsidy number two, future generations are subsidizing the present generation. In Lafayette, Louisiana, the median taxes paid by the median family are $1,500 a year to the city. They pay other taxes to the parish and the state and the federal government, but of the city's cut, it's $1,500 a year. In order for the city to make good on every promise they've made, every pipe to be maintained, every road to be maintained, all the fire, water, service, uh, police protection, everything else, maintain the parks, median family taxes would need to go from $1,500 a year to $9,200 a year. One out of every $5 the family makes we need to get sent to the city just to maintain the stuff they've already put in place. This can't happen. It, it, it won't happen. And so the city of Lafayette faces what we see every city in North America facing, the same exact challenge. Uh, at the end of the year, we have this huge backlog of maintenance needs, and we decide which ones we're going to fund and which ones we're going to put off for another year. And every year, that list grows and grows, and grows, and grows. There's an end point to this, right? The end point looks like, and I'm gonna put this in your, in your brain uh, to take home with you, uh, the end point looks a lot like Detroit. Detroit is actually the city in North America that pioneered the development pattern that we all copied. 
In the early 1900s, as Detroit was on its way to becoming the Motor City, they were the first city to run highways through the middle of their city. They were the first ones to build the couplets that you guys have in your core downtown, those traffic sewers that make it so difficult to, to walk around and get around to attract investment. They were the first city to tear down buildings at scale to make surface parking lots so that people could commute from the edge into the middle of the city. And they're the first city to reach kind of the inevitable conclusion of what happens when you spread out a productive city over a broad area, denuding and diluting the tax base while driving up your overall cost of services. They're the first ones to reach, in a sense, the insolvency crisis that all of our cities face. We have to make some choices today, uh, not necessarily uh, about uh, how we're going to build in the future. I actually think a lot of those choices have been made for us, but how we're going to deal with this massive insolvency problem that we've created for ourselves. In order to do this, uh, we at Strong Towns have focused on uh, land use issues, uh, we focus on economic development issues, on urban design issues, and of course, we focus extensively on transportation issues. And I want to talk to you for the, the rest of the time I have here about transportation in specific. Because we make enormous investments in transportation systems, uh, largely through the, the prism or the rubric of creating economic growth and opportunity. When I talk to people today, even at City Hall, people who are uh, in my opinion, uh, very good. You, you've, you, I'm going to say this, and, and just trust me, I meet with a lot of cities all over the place. You have a, a very competent staff at City Hall. Uh, they actually are doing very good work. Uh, they're trying very hard. Uh, I realize that change is difficult and change is, is tough. Uh, but you, you have a group that is, uh, uh, is substantially above average in terms of their attitude and their approach. But even as I talk with them today, uh, certain things are off the table. Certain ideas that to me uh, are self-evident and logical uh, are difficult to discuss because they're not part of the way things are done. I want to try to help you as a, as a community, as a group of people interested in these, separate yourself from the experiment that you have been handed and let, let's say that word again, this massive experiment that you have been handed, this complete divergence from thousands of years of human knowledge about how to build places, we threw away and we said we're going to do something completely different. We all live in a big experiment, something that's never been tried before. For us, it is, quote, the way things have always been. But you only have to go back a couple generations to see a radically different way of building. We are living in a big experiment. I want to give you a mechanism to take that experiment, put it in context, and recognize uh, that it is okay to change things because that's what people do when experiments are not working out. Let's start with this. This is uh, just a little sketch up of something that everybody in this room knows and understands but probably doesn't think about that much. In the business, we would call this the hierarchical road network. The idea that you know, small little local streets pour into collector streets, collector streets pour into arterials, arterials into major arterials, uh, you know, little to big, right? We understand how this works because this is a system we all live in and get around in every day. I want you to think about a watershed. Everybody here recognize how a watershed works, right? And I'm going to use Minnesota terms. So again, please be generous with me. If, if you have different Canadianisms for the things I'm going to talk about here, just try to interpolate. Um, in a watershed, you have uh, little ditches that will flow into little creeks. The creeks will come together into little brooks and streams. They will flow into rivers, which will flow into tributaries. Those tributaries will flow into major tributaries. Again, going from little to big. We understand that if we get rain throughout a watershed, if that rain is intense enough or persistent enough, all of that water will come together, and at the major tributary, we will get a flood. 
you experienced this recently with the road uh, between here and Vancouver, correct? You understand how flooding works throughout a watershed, right? We get this. It's a very common sense. Uh, this is like hydrology 101, right? I'm a civil engineer. I took hydrology 101. They spend about five minutes on this concept because everybody gets it. But for some reason, when hydrology 101 ends and we walk across the hall to traffic 101, we look at a very similar system, one uh, of concrete and asphalt. And for some reason, when we see that there is a little bit of action out throughout the commuter shed, we are completely baffled when that, when that action starts to add up and creates a flood. It's the same mechanism. We literally create the flood. In fact, if we set out to design a system to generate the maximum amount of congestion possible, this is what it would look like. We would take everybody that we could, we would put them in a car at the same exact time, and we would funnel them to the same location. We literally manufacture the flood. And this is why uh, congestion is a ubiquitous condition across this entire continent. You can go to any city of any size and they have a rush hour. Right? They have a rush hour where they experience intense levels of congestion. You can go to my little town of 13,500 people and if you go to the traffic signal in the middle of the town at 7.50 a.m. and talk to the person sitting there in their car and say, how's, how's traffic today? They'll say, oh, the congestion's overwhelming. It's unbearable. What should be done? Oh, we need more lanes, right? And 20 minutes later, there won't be a car in sight. Right? We all experience this. And because we all experience this, the traffic professions, engineering professions, transportation planners, respond to this uh, effect uh, by building bigger, by oversizing, by over-designing, by over-engineering. If you actually take a critical look at our systems, you will recognize that they are vastly over-engineered for the demand we actually have. As a user, as a driver, we most often don't recognize this, right? Because what is the impact to you if the system is over-designed by 100%? You have double the capacity you actually need. What do you experience as a driver? Free flow and open roads. You don't even recognize it. It's just a, a pleasant drive, right? But what happens if the system is designed 1% under the demand? Well, everything comes to a stop and you experience absolute gridlock. And so because of the way we build the system, there's an asymmetry of pain. We all experience a dull pain of paying too much to over-design and over-engineer systems that we're not really using all that productively. But we avoid the immediate pain of having high levels of congestion on our particular route. This effect of essentially inducing the flood, inducing levels of congestion, uh, and then over-designing and over-engineering uh, also parallels and feeds into a design concept known as forgiving design. And if you, you are an engineer in this room and you're younger than me, uh, which is increasingly more and more people, um, you, you probably don't know this term forgiving design. It's just called design now today. Uh, but the idea of forgiving is very important. Um, if we go back to the early days of the automobile, what we recognize is that uh, most of the early automobile uh, routes were old wagon routes. They were routes that we had driven horse-drawn wagons on. And if you think of someone riding in a horse-drawn wagon, if they would get to a, a large tree or a large rock or a gully, what would they do? They would just go around it, right? And so these paths tended to wind. Well, if you go out to a windy path and you put a high-performance surface down and drive a high-performance vehicle on it, people will get to one of those corners and they smash into things and they die. The rate of death in the early automobile era was astronomical. It is unfathomable. 
We had 40,000 people in the U.S. die last year on our roadways. If we had the rate of death today that they had in 1935, instead of 40, 42,000, it would be over half a million. The reason we don't have half a million people die is because of forgiving design. What engineers recognize is that drivers make mistakes, very natural, very human mistakes, and we could go out and design roads to compensate and forgive them, in a sense, for the mistakes that they make. Let me walk you through how this works, because it's actually very simple and very genius. Take a two-lane roadway. Uh, you've got a car traveling in each direction. We know and understand from our own behavior that sometimes a driver will float in their lane a little bit. Maybe they look down to turn the radio station. Maybe the kid is yelling in the back seat, whatever it is. When they float in the lane, we don't want them to cross the lane and hit an oncoming vehicle. So what we do is we give them a little bit of extra room. We widen out those lanes. We give them a little bit of extra room to move. We understand that drivers sometimes will go completely off the edge of the road. We don't want them to get sucked down into the ditch. We want them to be able to recover and get back on the road. And so what we do is we widen out the shoulders and give them a little recovery area there. We recognize now that sometimes drivers, despite their best intentions, despite being pragmatic, uh, despite being, you know, having all earnestness, will exit the roadway completely. And when they do that, they exit at very high speeds, at high velocities, at, at violent speeds. We want that kinetic energy of the moving vehicle to dissipate before they run into something that won't move, that won't give. And so what we do is we go out and we create a clear zone by removing all those obstacles on the side of the roadway. And now we have a forgiving design. Again, I'm going to say, millions of lives saved because of this. This is a genius approach. It, it has been copied around the world. It is the standard for safety when we're building highways. What is the problem with this design approach? It works really, really well on the open road. We are going to benefit greatly from this design approach as we drive home to Vancouver tonight. But where it doesn't work is in the middle of our cities. When we bring this mentality into our urban areas, when we bring this mentality into our neighborhoods, what happens is we signal to drivers something that we're not intending to signal them. We tell the driver through our design, we got your back. We've given you lots of buffer room, lots of room to move and to navigate. And what do drivers do when you give them lots of extra room? They, they speed up. And they don't speed up because they're reckless. They don't speed up because they're deviants. They don't speed up because they don't care. They speed up because they are human, right? They speed up because when you give them lots of extra capacity, extra performance, they use that to actually experience extra performance. If you go to the design manuals that traffic professionals use, you will be a little bit confused if you try to discern the difference between designing a highway and designing a local street. All of us live, uh, for the most part, on local streets. And we think of them very different than we think of highways. But if you go to, say, the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, even the uh, Canadian version of this book, and you look up the definition of a highway, it literally says highway, or I'm sorry, it literally says street, see highway. There is no discernment between what a street is and what a highway is in terms of the geometries that we use to design them. Uh, this leads to this very confusing situation where in order to give a margin of error for drivers, we will design a corridor for 60 mile an hour speed uh, I don't know what that would be in kilometers, but play with me here for a second. Uh, we, we design for a high speed. We put an enforced speed that's much lower, and we accept as a driving speed something in between, right? We've all seen these corridors. We've all experienced this type of thing. Um, engineers have a standard approach uh, to speeding, and it's an approach based on the insight that humans will drive the speed that they feel comfortable driving. Th this is not a de 
debatable point. Uh, we know from studies of human psychology that driving is a passive activity. All of you are able to drive and listen to the radio. All of you are able to drive and, and talk to a passenger in the neighboring seat. That's because your brain is not 100% engaged in driving. If your brain had to be 100% engaged in driving, none of us could do it. O only like jet fighter pilots and race car drivers can do that for an extended period of time. And because driving is a passive activity, humans will tend to drive the speed that they feel comfortable driving. I worked as a traffic uh, intern when I was an undergraduate, and I was the, the, the young kid who went out and did the traffic studies when cities would call. They'd say, people are driving really fast through our town. Could you come out and, and fix this? And the very first thing we would do would be to go out and do a traffic study. We'd go out and do a traffic study. Uh, I would write down the speeds that people were driving. And then we would ask a question, is there excessive speeding? If the answer is yes, there's a very clear response from the engineering profession. Raise the posted speed limit. I would go back to that city council and I would say, yeah, uh, the speed limit was 30. Everybody's driving 40. And so what we're going to do is make the speed limit 40. And that would freak everybody out. But that's actually the right answer on a highway. Why is that the right answer on a highway? Because on a highway where you're trying to move people, the most dangerous thing you can have is not speed. The most dangerous thing you could have is differential in speed. If someone is driving 50 and someone is driving 30, it's that differential that's going to create chaos and mayhem on the roadway. What you want when you engineer a highway is to have everybody driving similar speeds in a similar direction with as little conflict as you can. This is the way we design highways, but that body of knowledge does not work for local streets. It does not work for places where we don't want vehicles traveling fast. On a local street, our approach needs to change. We go out and we do a speed study. We say, is there excessive speeding? If the answer is yes, the proper response is to change the street design. We're actually signaling the wrong thing to drivers. We're actually telling drivers it's okay to drive fast with our design. Our design needs to change to signal something different to drivers. At Strong Towns, we have this saying, uh, if you need a sign to tell people to slow down, you designed your street wrong. A well-designed street should actually signal to a driver the proper speed. How would we do this? There's a, I'm sure there's a lot of you thinking, well, what, what are you talking about? The opposite of forgiving design. Instead of giving drivers wide lanes to navigate in, lots of buffer room, we narrow the lanes and tighten it up. Instead of giving them a recovery area on the side, we take that away and bring that in. Instead of removing all the obstacles, we actually bring the trees in and create a little bit of edge friction. Because drivers, when they're put in an environment with a lot of that, that buffer taken away, will do the natural thing and slow down. They don't have to be told. They don't have to have a police officer there. You don't have to have a sign. It is a natural human reaction to that type of built environment. This prompts us to ask a question about design speed. And I'm gonna, I, I, I've, I've created this chart. It, it, it's speed and value but we could also do speed and safety, it comes out the same way. We could do speed and return on investment, it comes out the same way. Uh, but let's just do it as value. What this chart is asking or suggesting is at what speed do we create the most value in our transportation system? And the answer to that question is when we're driving at very low speeds, when we're building a, a great street, or when we're traveling at very high speeds, when we're building a road. But we actually create the least amount of value. We build things that are the most dangerous, have the lowest rate of return, the further we get away from these edges. And in fact, we get to this middle area here where we're building not a street, not a road, but something that at Strong Towns we call a strode. 
a strode is the futon of transportation. Um, if you think of a, a, a futon, you have an uncomfortable couch that makes into an uncomfortable bed, right? It tries to do two things at once and it fails at both. A strode tries to be both street and road at the same time and it, it fails at both. Well, what's the difference? A road we can think of as a replacement for the railroad, right? Which, as the name suggests, is a road on rails. And if you think of how a railroad works, you, you get on in one place, you get off in another place, and there's a high-speed connection between the two. You don't have frontage railroads or drive-through railroads or anything like that. It's a high-speed connection between two places. Roads function best when they are high-speed connections between places. If you look at this strode, what you see is that all the elements here of high speed are there, right? You have four lanes. They are highway scaled, so they're very wide. You have a center turn lane so that the turning traffic can get out of the way and the through traffic can just speed on through. We've engineered this for very high speeds. Does anyone get to drive at high speed here? No. So despite spending enormous amounts of money to move vehicles quickly, nobody gets to move quickly here. What is a street? A street is, and always has been, a platform for building wealth. It is a platform for building a place. It is the framework for creating a, a community, a city, a place, an urban environment. That's what a street is. When we look at this strode, we see that the city has put in elements of a street, right? You've got wide sidewalks, you've got some attempt at decorative lights, you've got narrow crossings in some places, they'll put out benches and banners and other things at different times of the year. Is this street creating a lot of wealth for the community? No. Think back to that Lafayette map that I showed you. Uh, what happens in a place like this is we all understand if you're shopping over here and you want to go shop over here, Nobody walks across seven lanes, right? Nobody walks down here, waits for the light, comes across. What do they do? They get in their car, they whip a U-turn, and, and go over here. And because of that, all these businesses respond by having large parking lots, by having drive throughs and what you see is that the return on investment goes way down. The tax base gets diluted, it gets watered down, spread out, and your per foot of private investment is way low compared to your per foot of public investment. These places are insolvent. This is the strode. And when we think about transportation investments and we think about the things that we're trying to accomplish uh, with our tax dollars, uh, oftentimes we talk about things in terms of uh, dealing with congestion and expanding roadways. We often talk about uh, downtown improvements to you know, enhance pedestrian experience or what have you. We need to have an active conversation and a hyper focus over the next generation on eliminating our strodes and making our cities as strode free as possible. This means taking our, because quite frankly, your city is like 95% strodes, <laughs> right? That, that I don't say that pejoratively, Almost every city is 95% strodes. Some are like 98% strodes. Um, you, you are, your development pattern is dominated by this. We need to talk about how do we take our existing strodes and transform them into really great streets and really productive roads. I'm going to share with you right now how you do this. And I'm going to say it, and it's going to sound really, really, really simple. And it's going to sound simple because from a technical way, it is very simple. The difficult thing about this is the cultural overlay that we have in regards to our transportation system. Those things that we say, well, that's not possible. If we want to go from strode to street, what do we do? Well, the first thing we do is we slow traffic. We need people to drive slower. That's how we actually build wealthy places. You can't build a place that people want to be with vehicles speeding through. Those two things are incompatible. Have your vehicle speeding out on your road, but when you're in the street, 
you prioritize being in the place, right? So number two, prioritize. I, and I use the term pedestrian here. I hate the word. It's like an engineering word for a human, right? <laughs> you're a pedestrian transportation unit. No, you're a human being. So what we do is we prioritize being in the place over getting through the place. If you're trying to actually build a wealth-creating street, what you want is to focus on the experience of being in the street and de-emphasize how quickly we can get through. If we're going to build wealth in a place, we actually have to build. Your zoning codes, your regulations that stifle incremental development need to be refined. They need to be repealed. They need to be changed. Because on a great street, we need a lot of stuff being built. And streets are very complex places. We need to embrace that complexity. You should never design a street from a design manual. They always evolve and change over time as the adjacent land use changes and evolves over time. If we want to go from strode to road, then it's the exact opposite, right? Uh, instead of slowing down vehicles, we're going to speed it up. And the way we speed up traffic is to limit access. We don't want all the things that are going to conflict with the traffic stream. We've got to get rid of that. We want things to really, really move quickly. We have to separate our automobiles from other modes, modes being a, a planning geek term. Uh, let me put it this way. If you want people to bike on a road, putting them uh, along the shoulder with vehicles going by at lethal speeds is not acceptable. You need to have separate facilities. We need people to be able to bike long distances, but they need to be in places that are protected. We need dedicated bus lanes when we're traveling from place to place over distance. We want those to be very uh, fast and very efficient. If we're building a great road, what we don't want to do is degrade that road's capacity by building along it. The corridor development pattern needs to go away. And all of those corridor plans we have on the shelf need to just get thrown away and replaced with one word, like no, right? <laughs> Uh, if we're making a collective investment in a road, we're making an investment in moving quickly over distance. We're making that together. The idea that one or two businesses along it would cash in on that investment at all of our expense is just the wrong way to think about this. Roads are very simple. We need to embrace that simplicity. So let's go back to this. Because we've solved this problem. And I think the way we've solved this problem is very instructive for what needs to happen now. How do we solve this problem? The flooding problem in the watershed. If, if you look at it, for a long time we thought we could solve this problem mechanically, right? We'll build dams, we'll build dikes, we'll build levees, we'll build things. That hasn't worked out. And it hasn't worked out for a couple reasons that come down to the fact that we're very human. When we build these systems, they're systems that are around for 50, 60 years. Do we maintain them? Not really. When we build a, a, a levee to protect an area, do we stay out of that area? No, we go and build in it, right? So we go build in places that are protected by levees that we don't maintain very well. Again, we are very human. We've solved this problem, though, now. How do we deal with this watershed problem? The way we deal with the watershed problem now is not to just go build a bunch of stuff. That's really dumb. What we do is we go out to the outskirts of the watershed and we say things like, hey, uh, you can't fill in that wetland. Hey, you, you can't just run your water right into the ditch. You've got to like, let it soak in on your own site. Y you can't contribute to the flood. We basically require the rainwater to be retained at its source so that it doesn't cumulatively come together and create a flood. How do we deal with this problem? Well, we have tried to deal with this problem the same way we try to deal with the watershed problem, right? We'll build more lanes, we'll build more bridges, we'll build more capacity, we'll build more stuff. Does that work? No, it, it doesn't work at all. In fact, we've made ourselves broke doing this. How do we actually solve this problem? We go out here and we retain the trips near their source. 
We build neighborhoods. We build corner stores. We build corner markets. We build more housing. We build stuff. And we give people the option in that building pattern uh, to actually get their daily needs done without having to get into an automobile. This is a different development pattern than the one we have now. It's a development pattern that is not the pre-depression development pattern, but it looks a lot closer to that than our current pattern. And here's the amazing thing, is that when we look at a development pattern where we're going out and we're saying, let's build neighborhoods, let's replace these auto trips with other ways of getting around, congestion goes from being one of our biggest problems to actually our greatest ally. Because the thing that will drive demand for a corner store is a 20 minute drive to get a gallon of milk. I want to talk a little bit about what this development pattern looks like. Um, there's, there's a handful of things that we talk about at Strong Towns that uh, kind of universally cities need to think about and do. I'm going to go through three of them here uh, at the end real quick. Um, the first one is, is this. The idea that every neighborhood needs to be allowed to grow and evolve and change. We need to allow the next increment of development intensity by right. And that was a statement that included some planner jargon. So let me break this down. When I say something by right, what I'm saying is with the minimum amount of regulatory friction. If, if you have a neighborhood of single family homes, there should be no regulatory friction that prevents that neighborhood from evolving over the next decade into a neighborhood of duplexes. If I own a single family home in that neighborhood, I should be able to go into City Hall with a completed application, arrive at 9 a.m., and by noon have a permit and be out building my duplex. If we can do that, we provide the capacity for our neighborhoods to flex, evolve, for people to respond to stresses and opportunities, for our neighborhoods to again thicken up and to get some of that traditional development pattern aspect back. There's an adage that goes along with this. Uh, no neighborhood should experience radical change, but no neighborhood can be exempt from change. For a long time, our development pattern uh, was designed to build things all at once and to a finished state. Think of a new development going in. We go out and build 40 homes or 400 homes or 4,000 homes or whatever the scale is. We build them all at the same time. And for a while, that is the nice new neighborhood, right? You've all seen this. You've all experienced this. That's, that's the new neighborhood. It's very nice. It's a very nice place to be. After 25 years, 30 years in that neighborhood, what happens? Every house was built at the same time. And so everybody's roof goes bad at the same time. Everybody's siding needs to be replaced or maintained at the same time. Everybody's dishwasher breaks at the same time. Everybody's plumbing needs repairs at the same time. All at once, an entire neighborhood goes into decline. In the traditional development pattern, in the pre-World War II development pattern, what we saw when houses would go into decline, remember, these were not built all at once. They were built incrementally, this growth in the Petri dish, right? What would happen when a place like that would go into decline is that there was a mechanism to buy it and build something more intense. Remember those single-story buildings coming two- and three-story buildings, the wood buildings becoming brick and granite buildings? What happens in our neighborhoods when things go into decline? Our zoning rules, our regulations, lock them in place. We freeze them in amber. They're not able to evolve and change. And so what happens is they just stagnate. We see broad stagnation over time in all of these post-war development patterns. And the compromise that we've reached with ourselves is that if my neighborhood can just hang on and not change and evolve, I'm good with that. Let's keep the zoning in place. Let's keep the regulations in place. But we know we need more housing. We know we need change. Let's have that happen over there. Let's have that happen in that neighborhood. And we see this kind of cultural dysfunction where 
the poorest neighborhoods, the neighborhoods that are most uh, disenfranchised, are the ones that get the six-story apartment buildings. They're the ones that get the radical, radical transformation. I want to talk about what that does to a neighborhood. Because while that seems like a logical defensive measure for each of us individually, collectively as a community, it is really destructive. And it's destructive in multiple ways. I want to focus on the financial destruction of that. Let's say that you have three lots. Uh, on one lot is a single family home. On an adjacent lot, you have nothing, it's vacant. And on the third lot, you have a, a six, seven story condo building, apartment building, however you want to think of it. You own the middle lot and you want to sell it. At what price do you sell this lot? Well, if the only thing you can build on this lot is a single family home, the economics of its sale are a lot different. Because if you think of the land value as being 10 to 15% the overall developed value of the property, uh, that little single family home worth $200,000, you're going to be able to sell that land for, I don't know, around 30 grand. But let's say you look on the other side and you see a $10 million apartment building, condo building, and you realize that if whoever's going to buy your lot is going to build on it something this intense, that you can sell it for something closer to 1.5 million. You own the middle lot. What would you rather have? $30,000 or 1.5 million? We'd all rather have 1.5 million, right? Okay, now let me ask you another question. How much is that single family home worth once the vacant lot's worth 1.5 million? It's not worth 200,000 anymore, right? It's worth something very different. And nobody's gonna buy that house at the elevated price and say, oh, this is my dream home. I'm gonna raise my family here. I'm gonna go in and put in granite countertops and remodel the kitchen. No, because whoever buys that is gonna be buying it as an investment property with the idea that someday it's gonna be torn down and you're gonna have a, you know, a, 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 a huge development on it. And they're gonna rent it out at the lowest rate, or at the highest rate they can, with the lowest amount of upkeep possible. This is why when we respond to housing shortages by having everything frozen in place in one big place of upzoning, what we actually wind up doing is stagnating everything. Because we drive the investment in our neighborhoods to a few big players. And we make it unfeasible for everybody else to actually adapt and meet the overwhelming demand for housing that we see. Along with allowing this natural rate of growth, this incremental growth everywhere all at once, uh, we need to consciously go out and lower the bar of entry. Uh, we have, through many, many good and honorable reasons, raised the bar of entry to full participation in our society. Um, let me give you two examples of what I mean by lowering the bar of entry. Um, this is something in my community that we call a tiny house. My ancestors in the same community would have called this a house. We have put the adjective tiny on it uh, and subjected it to all kinds of requirements. Uh, what is essentially a starter home. If you want to build a tiny house in my community, you have to meet all the requirements of a house house. And then you have to meet subpart A through M of the tiny house provisions. You have to go beg permission from your neighbors. You have to genuflect in front of the planning board. You, you have to do all these things in order to build what is basically a starter house. For thousands of years around the world, people built in this form. And when they'd save up a little bit of money, they would put an addition on the back. When they'd have a kid, they'd put on a second story. The neighbor would come over and help. They would go over and help them. This is a starter home. We should be building thousands of these across the city. This should be the easiest possible thing to do. Because what this is, is this is a, a startup for somebody. L let me ask you this. How many of you in this room want to live in a 600 square foot home? Okay, let me ask you a different question. How many of you have lived in a 600 square foot home? Yeah, look at that. We all started somewhere. The idea that we would say, 
no, you can't get your start, is, is, is damaging all of us. We need to lower the bar of entry. Here's a commercial version of this. Um, you have a very beautiful core downtown. On, on the, the North Shore, you've got a lot of funky stuff going on. It's a really cool place. The North Shore has a lot more startup opportunities, as you said, than the core downtown. But the core downtown has a ton of room for startup opportunities. We just don't think of it in this way. In Muskegon, Michigan, they have a ton of entrepreneurs, but they didn't have any place for them to go. They didn't have a North Shore. They had a core downtown, and if you wanted to start a business in Muskegon, you had to go to the core downtown and sign a long-term lease and put a couple hundred thousand dollars into fixing up a building, or you had to go out on the edge and compete with the big box stores and the franchises. And because of this, they had a dearth of entrepreneurs, despite having a community full of creative entrepreneurial people. They went out, bought a bunch of storage sheds, painted them out funky colors, put them in a gap in their streetscape, and rent them out at really low rates with no long-term commitment to start up entrepreneurs. And what is an entrepreneur in this sense? An entrepreneur is a crazy person who doesn't know they can fail. <laughs> we want that kind of people in our community, right? We want them to try and try and try and try again. We want them to be able to try and fail where the stakes are really low so that they can try again and fail and try again and fail and then ultimately figure it out. And when they figure it out, they graduate from here into something more substantial. We see this in Muskegon, where their downtown now is full of businesses, many of them that got a startup in these storage sheds where the stakes were very, very low. The last concept I, I want to share with you that we need to do to uh, respond to this myriad of challenges we have is, is change our public investment approach. We have built all of this stuff and we do not have the wealth or capacity to maintain everything that we have built. We do not have the capacity to maintain every road, every pipe, every drainage system. We don't have it. We will have fewer road miles a generation from now than we have today. What that means right off the bat is that we should stop building more. There's no reason for us to build more. There's no reason for us to, as a community, take on the burden and liability of maintaining more, we should be done with that. But in addition to being done with it, we actually have to go back and make better use of the stuff we've already built. This means going back and responding to how people are using the city as it has been built. Where are people having a difficult time using what we have created for them? At Strong Towns, we have come up with a four-step process, a four-step process to make the lowest risk, highest returning investments that it's possible to make. I'm gonna go through this process with you right now, and this should be the basis for public investment in Kamloops and in, in every city across North America. Step number one, we go out and we humbly observe where people in the community struggle. Where do people have a difficult time using the city as it has been built? I'm gonna stress humility here. Often when we have technical expertise or other types of knowledge, we have an idea of what should happen or what should be in our mind. What I am saying is go out and free your mind of those things. Actually try to understand where are people having a difficult time? Step number two then, ask yourself a question. What is the next smallest thing we can do right now to address that struggle? Notice I didn't say, how do we fix this for all time? How do we make this all better? How do we solve this problem? I'm saying, what is the next smallest thing that we can do that will make this a little bit easier for the person who's having this struggle? Discipline yourself to think in small increments. Step number three, do that thing. Do that thing right now. Don't send it to a committee. Don't hire a consultant. Don't wait for your next capital improvements plan. It's a small little thing. Just go out and do it. Step number four is re-repeat this process. 
and repeat it over and over and over. We need, instead of one big project, a thousand small projects. Instead of one big bet on our future, we need hundreds of little bets all over the place. Bets that many of them won't work out, but the ones that do will enlighten us and point us to ever greater ways to improve the community. We go out and we fix a crosswalk where we notice people having a difficult time and nobody additionally uses that crosswalk. What are we out? A little bit of time and energy it took to fix a crosswalk. We can afford to lose that money making a bad investment. But we go out and fix a crosswalk and what we find after that is that all kinds of people start using it. And then we follow those people around and we humbly observe, where's the next place people struggle? What's the next thing? And we start to get that complex feedback loop back, that incremental development pattern that drives investment and drives investment by making the city better all the time. There's an idea called complete streets. And many of you have probably heard of this. I, 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 I'm sympathetic to this notion. Uh, it is an idea that our streets, as we built them in the post-World War II era, uh, were incomplete because they didn't take into account all of the different ways that people got around. We designed them strictly for automobiles, and so now in order to make them complete, we need to go back in and add places for uh, you know, pedestrian units, <laughs> right? Uh, add places for... Uh, bikes, add places for buses. There's a very uh, U.S. kind of centric thinking here, right? Th there's a certain uh, separate but equal notion that you get. Everybody gets a place. Bikes get a place. Pipe and walking get a place. Cars get a place. I'm not a fan. Uh, I'm not a fan because I, I think it puts the emphasis in, in the wrong place. Um, complete streets are designed to accommodate pedestrians in an auto-dominated realm. I get how this is a stepping stone, but it's got to be a stepping stone to something more consequential, something more substantial. That something is a strong town's approach. It's building a great street. Great streets accommodate automobiles in places dominated by people. It's people that build wealth. It's people that live in homes. It's people that create place. It's people that start businesses, fall in love, compose poetry, make music. It's people that do all the things that we need to be done in our cities to make them great, prosperous, wonderful places. We have had an era now where we've tried this new experiment, this experiment where in our neighborhoods we were gonna focus on getting cars through quickly. In our development pattern, we were going to focus on uh, having codes and regulations that could quickly replicate a pattern over and over and over. That era is coming to an end. And the quicker that we can end it here, the better we can get on, the quicker we can get on with something that will actually build our wealth, build our prosperity, build our capacity, have that wealth be built in a broad fashion and experience a development pattern that not only increases our capacity, but allows us to broadly live lives that are much more prosperous, much more complete, much more fulfilling. That is the essence of a strong town's approach. The idea that we can spend less, uh, get more, and live a, a much higher quality of life in the process. Thank you everybody for the invitation. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for uh, inviting me to be here and, and, and turning out in such numbers. Uh, I'm very excited to hear your questions and continue this conversation with you. Thank you so much. So uh, while Mitch is getting the microphone, if you have a question, go ahead and put your hand up. He'll bring it over to you. Uh, I'm going to ask, because I was asked to ask this, uh, that you keep your questions somewhat succinct. And if you have a long statement you want to make, uh, maybe you can go out afterwards with everybody and make a long statement. Um, I also want to point out that, that Norm is here. Uh, Norm is our member advocate. Uh, Strong Towns is a, a member-based organization. Uh, I always tell people if you're very interested in what we've done here tonight, 
Uh, our website is strongtowns.org. I invite you to go there. Uh, we publish two, three articles a day. We've got three different podcasts. We're on every social media platform. We're doing everything we can to share this message with other people. If you really appreciate what we've done here tonight, uh, you should know that all of our content is Creative Commons licensed. That means that it's free for you to access, it's free for you to use, and not only that, if you particularly like something that we've done, you are free to copy it, put your name on it, pretend that you wrote it, uh, and give it to whoever. We are trying to share ideas, and if you want to honor what we're doing, uh, you will share these ideas in your words with, with other people in your community. Uh, finally, if you really, really, really like what we're doing and appreciate what we're doing, uh, we are a member-based organization. You can chat with Norm about how to become a member. You can go to our website and sign up to become a member. Uh, being a member means I support this movement. I know we have a lot of people in this room that are members tonight, and I just want to say thank you. So go ahead, Mitch. No? Okay. Oh, you got it? I think I got it. All right. Okay, so also, Chuck, we also have some copies. We also have some copies of his book for sale outside, uh, if you want to check it out. But I don't think we have a second mic for questions, so you're just going to have to speak really loudly. All right. Loudly. Speak loud. I have to repeat them anyway, because they want me to do that for the camera. Um, I can't see anybody, so. <laughs> Go ahead, Hi, please. My name is Nancy Duffel. I'm one of many council candidates that are here tonight. Um, inclusionary zoning is something that you sort of alluded to, uh, where people can make changes within a neighborhood, but usually neighborhoods are really re resistant to that. Yeah. So what are some strategies to get buy-in to allow neighborhoods to evolve? Okay, it's a great question. You, you started out using the term inclusionary zoning uh, and then said, what, what is a good strategy for helping neighborhoods evolve? Because we often run into resistance uh, when we're trying to do this. Um, let, me, let me draw a quick distinction because I did not use the term inclusionary zoning. Uh, I know it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of inclusionary zoning the way that I understand it, uh, which is the way that I see it manifest most often is we have a very big developer over here who wants to build 200 units. Uh, we're gonna require them to have 20 of those units uh, be affordable in order to get the permit to build the other 180, <coughs> and we negotiate on that number, and we have some mandates in our code. I, I, I think that our affordable housing crisis is never gonna be solved from the top down. And I think instead of having a dearth of affordable units being built by uh, big developers, uh, what we have is a dearth of small developers working across the landscape to build many, many, many projects. That's the only way we're gonna scale this thing. And so to directly answer your question, uh, I think that what we need is a broad policy shift so that Every project is not a big project that we fight over. There are a lot of little projects. And we need to get people in our neighborhood used to a lot of small changes happening over time instead of uh, fighting over what neighborhood is gonna accept the large transformative change. That means we need to bring in and invite and train a whole cadre of developers to work at the block level. Uh, a good developer working at the block level communicates with people on the block and actually build support for their projects over time. Uh, we need to support those small developers by having a zoning code that allows, by right, the, that next increment of change. If you wanna come in and transform the single family home into a duplex, we need to make that as seamless and easy as possible so you don't have to go genuflect in front of a board, you don't have to have fights with neighbors, you don't have uh, uncertainty as to whether you get approval. Go ahead and keep the cumbersome nasty, months-long process you have for the big projects that you want to do. I don't think we should be doing those anyway, but just make it easier for those small ones to do it. We can do that by a citywide change in zoning, a citywide change in building practices, and a citywide change in, in the way that we subsidize development. I think we can generate a consensus around that. And then what you do is you change the 
quote unquote fight uh, from a hundred neighborhood fights to like one, what I think is gonna be a very common sense policy discussion. That's what I would like to see done. We wanna get those uh, incremental developers, those people working at the block level uh, out of the firing line and get them just doing good work in the neighborhoods. Please, somebody else. Um, Mitch, do you, can you? Yeah. Because I, I can't see as sure. many people. There's one right over here. Okay, mm -hmm. please. Um, so you mentioned that you uh, are downtown and it's really lovely here and that it's a really great, you know, all these really great little things about it. On the other hand, I was wondering if when you were driving around today, if you had any particular areas where you were like, huh, this is, I see a problem here and these are maybe some action items I would do to fix them. Do you have any moments like that that you think that uh, if you could, you would work on them next? Um, so the question was, you know, I, I, I like the downtown. Were there any things that jumped out at me as, as things that I thought were problematic that I would work on fixing next? Um, well, let me give you one that, that kind of came up in our walking tour today. Uh, you have the couplet in the downtown. He means the one ways of lands down in Yeah, Park. thank you. The one ways that go through your downtown. In, in engineering speak, it's called a couplet. You can go fast one way, you can go fast the other way. Um, these are traffic sewers. They create a moat uh, around your nicest area in the downtown. It's very sad to me because you have this place that is difficult to cross. Um, when you have a downtown like that, uh, that's, that's very nice and, and kind of starting to mature and get even nicer. Um, again, remember when I look at your downtown, Victoria Street, is that what's um, I'm looking at something that in my eyes is not very mature, right? What I'm seeing there is an adolescent that is starting to like come into their own, that I'm looking forward to them becoming a teenager, right? It needs to grow up more, but it's actually a very nice adolescent. Like I'm looking and I'm like, oh, I'm very optimistic of the direction this is going. The question becomes, how do you make that happen? And I think in a different community you would say, the natural thing is to get rid of those couplets, get rid of those one ways. Um, but here, uh, the one ways actually getting rid of them doesn't, I think, give you that much immediately. And it will come at a very high cost in terms of not just engineering, but also, I, I think, uh, public uh, discussion and discourse. And so when you get beyond that, what really needs to happen is that the neighborhoods adjacent to those couplets need to thicken up and develop. You need hundreds more, thousands more people living in those areas. And the couplets actually become things that we need to figure out how to cross, how to make a little easier to get across. That will help your core downtown mature. It will also help those neighborhoods grow. And I think ultimately it will give us the base of support we need to fix those couplets. On one area, you have a massive parking lot, surface parking lot, that is city owned. Um, now, go through and list the urgent needs that you have as a community. You have a, a, an affordable housing, it was described to me many times today as a crisis. We have a crisis of housing shortages. Um, we have jobs we need to create. We have a tax base, we, we need to increase our tax base. We have all these things, just go down and list all of them that are urgent priorities for you. I, when I see this massive surface parking lot, uh, am looking at millions of dollars invested in public infrastructure to do one thing, store vehicles temporarily throughout the day. That is a ridiculously low use of that property. And if we were to evaluate that piece of property uh, kind of uh, you know, rationally, we would say that that is a massively underutilized public asset. Let's pretend that that parking was critical to your future, which I don't think it is, but let's just say as a public discourse that having that many parking spots is critical to your discourse, critical to your community success. Um, you would be far better off having that same number of parking stalls in a vertical uh, ramp of some sort, a vertical garage, and freeing up the rest of that space for development something built on there that would fill other needs that you had. But Chuck, how would we do that? We don't have the money to build a ramp. We don't. This is where I think we need a little bit of uh, 
entrepreneurial thinking. Because lots and lots of cities have recognized this conundrum. And what they've done is they've gone in and they've said, okay, we are going to actually develop this piece of property and use the revenue that we make off of selling it to different developers to not only uh, enhance the public realm and make this investment very valuable, uh, but we're gonna do it in such a way that we can actually then build, afford to build the parking ramp. We're gonna take this underutilized asset and use it to solve multiple public policy objectives at the same time. That's a different way of thinking about your city. But I feel like that mode of thinking is the next step that you need to take. Because if you look at that and you say, okay, we got parking taken care of, check that off the list. Now let's go take care of affordable housing. Oh yeah, that's way over there. You're doing it wrong. We have to do multiple things at one time on public property like that. And if we do it right, we can actually leverage the incredible asset that we have for multiple purposes and cash flow it in the process. Uh, one back here. I think that's James. Okay, thank you. How bicycling fit into your fabric of strong town? How does bicycling fit into the fabric of, of a strong town? Um, well, the fabric of a strong town is made up of two types of transportation, streets and roads. Bicycling fits great into both. It fits ideal into both. And in fact, when I talked about building neighborhoods, uh, in my mind, a neighborhood is a place uh, where you can bike on a street within. I think the ideal scenario is one where the streets are well designed so traffic flows at neighborhood speeds. And when traffic flows at neighborhood speeds, you don't need bike lanes, you don't need extra bike facilities. Bikes are part of that slow speed fabric. Um, and neighborhoods are connected with great roads, roads that connect places at speed over distance. And when we're building at speed over distance, uh, what we want is separate bike facilities that are protected from the traffic stream so that people on bike can travel very quickly one mile, two miles, six miles, ten miles across the region. Um, when I think of transportation, I actually think that the, in an ideal scenario, the dominant form of transportation uh, that we would see in a community would be a bike. I realize that that's not how we live today. I realize it's, it's, it's motor vehicles. I don't think that next year the dominant mode of transportation should be bike. But when you start building neighborhoods, what you find very quickly is that the economics of owning two cars is really nonsensical. If we can get a family uh, in a situation where they can go from having two cars to having one car, uh, they literally free up and this was in old interest rate terms, I don't know what it would be today, but something like $120,000 of capacity uh, for buying a, a house. I, I don't know what houses, I, I know housing is kind of insane right now in your community, but in my community, uh, that would be the price of a house in some neighborhoods. So in other words, if you could live in the neighborhood and we could get you down from two cars to one, you, you're basically substituting the cost of a second car for an entire house the payment, right? Um, once you start building neighborhoods, what happens is that the economics of your community transform. And biking becomes not just a cultural activity that people partake in, uh, but something that I, I think just logically flows out of it, out of having neighborhoods. Um, because with a bike, you can bring home groceries, you can cross distances. Um, but when you build a neighborhood really well, one of the things that happens is that uh, bikes tend to take over, but then you find that people actually migrate beyond the bike too. Uh, I used to bike to the office. Uh, I think my neighborhood has kind of slowly transformed into being very nice in, uh, in North Brainerd. And I, don't, I rarely bike now. And I rarely bike because it's too quick. I like the walk. It's a nice commute. But yeah, I, I envision a city where uh, instead of bikes being 2% of the, uh, the trips, 
they would be something more like 60 or 70 percent of their trips. And if we did that, let me just say this one last thing. All the money you're spending on gasoline, all the money you're spending on auto insurance, all the money you're spending on auto payments for that second vehicle that you don't need anymore is all money that not only would you keep and retain, but when you spent it, is more likely to stick around the community and build your wealth and capacity. When you make a car payment, it's going somewhere else. When you buy gasoline, sure, the local gas station might be a little bit, but the bulk of the cost of that is exiting your community very quickly. When we think of the velocity of money, uh, what we want as an economic development strategy are strategies that keep capital local and have it pass around the community, as opposed to come in and then exit very, very quickly. The automobile is a capital extraction device from your community. And by making every trip an automobile trip, what you've done is you've ensured that your community will struggle to build wealth. So yeah, the more we can have people biking, just the better off you're gonna be financially as a community. Public health and all that being, you know, a uh, bonus in a sense. I wanted to wrap back around to Chuck's presentation really quickly because he showed the picture of the watershed, right? And how we hold trips at their source. So we talked about developing neighborhoods in Kamloops. The number one thing you see in every comment about developing bike infrastructure in Kamloops is what about the hills, right? We don't take into account that like we have about 14,000 people in Kamloops who actively ride up hills for fun on GPS apps, you know, <laughs> they're already there. But the second part is, is that if you're already on the hill and you're, you're originating your trip and finishing your trip at the same elevation on the hill, that's a different conversation than going from Costco to the North Shore. You know, we're not, when we're talking about bike infrastructure, it's not just about bike lanes, it's also about if we're building neighborhoods where you're staying in your neighborhood, then the hill is not such an issue when, when you're talking about bikes. You, you, you also, I mean, that, I remember when the Segway came out, and everyone's like, oh, it's gonna transform transportation. And then it's like, what? This is kind of dumb. Um, <laughs> E-bikes e are gonna transform transportation. And you know, particularly in a place like this where the hills are an issue for some people, uh, if you've never had a chance to ride an e-bike and you have an opportunity, take it. You'll be shocked, just shocked, at how easy it makes biking distance, right? And I know there's issues to be worked out about them uh, and conflicts with people walking and what have you and are they safe and da da da. Uh, again, in a context of streets where speeds are very low, an e-bike will fit right in because it will also be traveling very slow in those environments. In an environment where we have great roads over distance, e-bikes are amazing because they just geometrically increase the amount of land you can cover. Uh, even people uh, who are not great bikers. Please. Uh, back uh, corner. I just gonna. <laughs> Gisela? Yeah, I, I really like the uh, image that you put up of the, the watershed thing too. I've never seen it put that way for travel before. It makes a lot of sense. But I'm also looking around our city and I'm seeing places like that on the hills, like the entire upper Aberdeen area, where we have what are basically roads in existence. And there is no commercial development in most of those neighborhoods. And I, I guess the idea is to be able to work and live kind of close together. But given that we have no commercial space in those neighborhoods, how do we do that? Are you, are you suggesting that you know, we take one of these roads and just narrow it down and make it better for bikes? Or I, I'm still not seeing the mechanics of how we can take the existing neighborhoods, which are saying we shouldn't build further out, we're talking about what we've got here. Yeah. How do we transform these existing car dependent neighborhoods with no commercial land left into something where we can get rid of our car So I'm gonna ask a question before I repeat the question. Are, are you, what is adjacent to these strokes? Is it residential homes? Like what's there? Yeah, chalk Oh, okay, so these are strokes in residential areas. Yes. Okay, so what do we do with strokes in residential areas? How do we recapture these things? Uh, where do we put commercial in places where there, there is just pure residential homes? Um, 
Okay. <laughs> um, I, 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 how much time do we have left? Because I want to take a question after this one, because I don't want to end on this one. <laughs> uh, I would say uh, it's eight thirty right now. How about one more after this? Okay. And someone have a happy question after this. Um, so remember when I showed you the map of Lafayette and I talked about Detroit when I did that? Yeah. Um, and I don't know if you've ever been to Detroit, but I'm sure that many of you have seen pictures of it. Uh, it's absolutely devastating in many areas. It's, it's hard to fathom. And I, I want to describe to you what has happened. Places that people built that they thought would be there forever are now gone. They've just gone away. They've burned down. They've fallen down. Trees are growing up in them. These are neighborhoods that once existed. People lived there. People assumed they would be there forever. They no longer are. Uh, one of the implications of this experiment that we've been on and this kind of slash and burn style of building that we do is that a lot of the neighborhoods we've built, uh, quite frankly, have no future. They're very difficult to retrofit. They're very difficult to change. Once they enter that decline phase, they're very difficult to rescue. Uh, they're on strodes. They have restrictive zoning. Uh, they have a cultural overlay to them that resists change. And at some point, we are going to have to make that decision. We already are making that decision here. Uh, but we will have to make it even more intentionally or more purposely on what road we fix and what road we fall, let fall apart. Where do we, in this huge backlog of maintenance we have, deploy our resources to the, to the, to the best advantage? Neighborhoods like the one you've described, the strode through the residential neighborhoods, are the most difficult ones to see surviving uh, the next generation or two. Um, they're difficult because they are engineered and designed from their start. The marketing brochure that, that goes along with them is, uh, you know, promotes isolation and no change. That's their DNA. If you go to the downtown and the core areas around them, we see that we have imposed on them a certain stasis. We've imposed on them a certain uh, lack of adaptability and change, um, but that's not their natural DNA. And, and we can like unleash it there and see things like corner stores and first floor retail and second floor housing. We can see these things evolve out of that because that's actually their natural state. But what you're describing, a strode with cul-de-sacs coming off of it and stuff like that, those areas are built initially to resist all change. They're also uh, financially the least productive development pattern. They actually cost exorbitant amounts of money. They assume a kind of permanent affluence of the residents. And they have actually, on a per foot basis, the lowest level of financial productivity, the lowest amount of tax base. And so these are places that financially just are, are, are completely absurd from a community standpoint. It's the last investment you would try to collectively rescue because it's investment that never should have been made. And so there are all kinds of brilliant people out there who are working on things uh, that go by the name suburban retrofit or sprawl retrofit or sprawl repair. Um, I admire these people because they are brilliant. They have a, a lot of great ideas. Uh, I question the viability financially of the things they're putting forward. And I deeply question the social viability of the things they're putting forward. Because what they're asking neighborhoods like this to do is to suddenly wake up one day and say, I know I bought here because it gave me isolation. I know I bought here so I would never have to meet my neighbors. I know I bought here uh, so that the neighborhood would never change. But now I am going to embrace the opposite of all of that and welcome in the, you know, my front yard being converted to a corner store and the neighborhood to put an addition onto their building and make it into a triplex. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite all that in. I, I've never seen it work. And so in, in my first book, in the book Strong Towns, I actually say, I think that we are going to have in our lifetimes 
a active business model of suburban salvage, where we go into places like that that have gone into decline and we pull out the copper wires, we pull out the fixtures, we pull out the things that are reusable, uh, and then we dispose of the rest, which is what you see in a, a lot of the neighborhoods in, in Detroit. Um, that's a very depressing way to think of things. And, and I'm going to acknowledge that it's hard for us to get our minds wrapped around that because a lot of these neighborhoods are the new neighborhoods, the nice places, right? They're the places that the most affluent people in the community live in today. But I want you to recognize that if we went to the most affluent neighborhoods in the city in 1935 and we talked to the people who lived in those neighborhoods and those places and we said, guess what? In 10 years and 15 years, this neighborhood's going to be pretty much abandoned. This house is going to be in total disrepair. Everything around you is going to be total disrepair. And everybody here is going to pick up and move out to there. They would have said, that is insane. That would never <coughs> happen. That sounds absolutely crazy. And then it happened. I'm going to give you one last thing. In terms of the community's core infrastructure, there is no way to, in a sense, abandon the core and keep the edge. In other words, everything from the edge, think of like a water system or the sewer system, everything flows through what was there before. It's built off of what was originally there. And so if you want the edge development, you have to, at a minimum base, maintain the core development. But you can have the core development with all the edge failing and going away. It's very simple to do. In fact, it, it makes the core stuff work better. And so I feel like the biggest challenge we're going to have in those kind of areas is not how do we retrofit them, because I think unless there's a huge cultural shift in a place like that, I don't think they'll ever be retrofitted. There's a lot of them that just can't be and won't be. I think the biggest problem we're going to have in places like that is that we're going to abandon a lot of poor people to life out there. When you move the wealthy people out of the center of city out to the edge and you abandon poor people in the center of the city, poor people wind up living in, in, a, in a, a disadvantaged state, but one that is, in a development standpoint, still kind of coherent. They can get on a bus and get somewhere. They can walk to a market. They can get to a job. They're poor and they're struggling and it's not great, but it's coherent. If wealthy people, as we see in major cities, and we're starting to see more and more in, in second tier and third tier cities as well, if wealthy people start to occupy the core downtown and the surrounding neighborhoods, and poor people are moved out to the edge, let's go to Vancouver and look at what's gone on there, right? as poor people are moved out to the edge, they are forced to live in a development environment that assumes a high level of affluence. It assumes ownership of two vehicles. It assumes uh, a high level of affluence to be able to maintain a property. It assumes a bunch of things that are not true about the poor. And so abandoning poor people out on the edge, I think is going to be the greatest generational challenge that we have as we transition into a new development pattern. And so when you t describe this place, that's what my biggest fear would be. How do we, as we transform our downtown and our core neighborhoods, do it in such a way that it doesn't become a project of the rich? It becomes a, a broader, more participatory project so that people are not left behind or pushed out to the edge, but they are included in uh, the building of wealth and building a place as we go. So someone asked me a question with a happier answer. Yeah. I also just want to contextualize one other thing there is, you know, I do work on rezoning projects and things like that, so I, I, I help with sort of the politics of this, is that I, when, what I led with was that we will have different responses in different neighborhoods, right? To how these things go. And That's a good way to, put it. to go to, you know, Chuck's slide about doing something small, do it right now, repeat. Neighborhoods like the North Shore and downtown that were built with that DNA, 
that people walked here bef because all these streets were built before there was cars here. These places have low-hanging fruit. They are a relatively easy place in which to make a change. When I talk to somebody in my neighborhood of the North Shore on McDonald Park, and I'm working on, like, let's say, a duplex or a fourplex that's going to go into a zone, and it's on a place where there was a crack shack. And I say to the neighbors, you know, I know that none of you want a fourplex here, but your option is crack shack or fourplex. You know, which one do you want? Well, I, okay, I really want a duplex or single family house, but what I'm going to get is a fourplex, and that's going to be better than the crack shack. The, the folks who have purchased the single family home, they've purchased the isolation, the privacy, the yard, the fact that they have a pool in the back and they can be naked and listening to their music really loudly while drinking beer at their pool. The reason they bought there, they don't want to live in the center of town. They have no interest in that. They don't want to be part of this, but we have so much low hanging fruit of people who already do want to live downtown. People who want to find a place in the North Shore to move into, to live in. And so as much as, yeah, retrofitting uh, the suburbs that we have is maybe some place we're going to get to one day. But right now, to me, the priorities are TRU, North Shore, downtown, places that already have that underlying DNA and have low hanging fruit to make small incremental change, not radical change, small incremental change. So that's my thought there. Awesome. That, that, that four step process that I brought up, the underlying assumption of that is that we don't know where the successful place will be. We don't know where prosperity will emerge. Remember I talked about the traditional development pattern being like this iterative thing? And the reality is, is that we've got this landscape that no human civilization has ever had to emerge prosperity from. So the four step process is actually a way to figure out with low level experimentation where things are gonna take and where that low hanging fruit is. Because what happens is if you do a little experiment and it works, you double down on it, and you double down on it, and you keep iterating till it becomes a better place. It's a, it's a humility that we don't know how to solve this problem. So we have, a, we have an approach to help us figure it out. You have a happy question. Maybe. All right. So, Last question then, go for it. Okay, so you talked a lot about bikes. Uh, to get around town. I'm interested in what you, how you would go about implementing public transit in order to build a strong town. Kamloops, as an area, has a lot of industrial opportunities for people, whether it's mills or you know the mines. For a lot of the places that are more local that don't have access to public transit, shuttles or even just could be away, but in the meantime, because the city needs to have a lower income class of people, how would you go about introducing public transit to subsidize people who can't afford cars? Okay, the question is about public transit and what I would do to subsidize uh, transportation for people who can't own cars. Um, I wrote a, a whole chapter in my latest book, in Confessions, a recovering engineer a, about transit. And um, I made a lot of transit advocates mad and upset. Um, because I pointed out right off the bat that the way we tend to think about transit is the way that you just described it. And I, did I just lose my mic? I think I ran out of juice. Well, that was good timing for last question. All right, I don't have to speak in front of a group for another 10 days, so let me ruin my voice. Um, the way that I describe transit in the book is by noting that our auto-based transportation system doesn't pay for itself. It is the vehicle of insolvency. Uh, it, we are actually building ourselves into bankruptcy with this auto-based transportation system. When we think of transit, as, uh, in a sense, charity, we actually look at, like, transit is something for poor people. We make transit a charitable overlay on an insolvent system. So, uh, say that a different way. We say, we are going to actually spend more money to subsidize a, trans a, a not viable uh, transportation method 
on an unviable transportation system. Th that, that is to me like double insane. I don't understand that mindset. I get how from an empathetic standpoint, we're like, wow, this is a screwed up system for poor people. It's a screwed up system for everybody. To me, I feel like the way we do transit well is we recognize what transit is. Transit is the greatest force multiplier we have for building great places. And if we focus on deploying transit in a roads and streets kind of framework, what we do is we actually build a system that works not just for poor people, but works for everybody and works great for poor people. Okay? So when I look at your streets in the downtown and I see these one-way couplets, to me, the one-way couplet should be one lane or two lanes. That should be the first thing we do and have a dedicated bus lane through there that stops every block. And I know you have buses that run up and down there now, but they got to pull in and out of traffic. They got to negotiate. No, you just have dedicated space. Have it there. Have it sitting there. Why? You've got all this extra room. You've got the buses. Why are you wasting this huge investment you've already made in this corridor in such a low productive way? Make it easy to get around. Have the bus not have to, you know, negotiate in and out. They can have more rapid, more frequent service. Have circulators. Have it run in. What, what you want is you want that person who says, I need a parking spot here to be able to park over there instead and have a really reliable bus system they can get on that will get them four blocks or six blocks or eight blocks like that, right? What you want is a system where it's easier to get around on bus than it is by car. And when you get to that point, what you find is that the transit investments start to accelerate the lifestyle of living in a neighborhood. It starts to actually be a multiplier of wealth. And so now your bus system is not charity for the poor. Sure, it works for the poor. Maybe give them free bus passes. That would be awesome, right? But if you build a system around serving the poor, the first time you run into financial trouble, you just cut that system. You build a system that works for the community and is essential part of your transportation, it will never get cut. I, I think that we think about transit backward. And our goal should be to have a system uh, that improves the quality of life for every neighborhood that it connects to, uh, but doesn't try to be uh, a, a, a thing that serves everywhere all the time. Um, and let me say this in like a technical transit way. Uh, in a, in a trade-off between uh, frequency and coverage area, because we think of these as charitable overlays, we tend to emphasize coverage area. How do we get really crappy service everywhere? What I would like to do is see us switch to more of a system that emphasizes frequency. How do we provide really great service in, in, in maybe even a lesser land area? Now, in order to do that and still accomplish our public policy objectives of the poor, which I don't think is the central focus of our transit system but can be part of it, that is a land use solution, not a transportation solution. That means we need more housing in walkable distance of where we've got great transit. We need to build that housing not just at high-end price points, but at many different price points. That means we need to unleash small-scale developers to be working in many different price points throughout a neighborhood in proximity to transit. So transit does not become the way we solve poverty. We deal with poverty in different ways, and transit serves a functional land use pattern. Does that make sense? That was a happier question. Yeah. <laughs> because that's within our capacity to do. Again, if you want a model for this, um, Jarrett Walker, uh, Human Transit, great book. Uh, if you want to see a model, we did a write-up about Houston's transit transformation. Uh, Houston, Texas. Uh, which is you don't think of as being a transit-friendly place, actually has one of 
uh, North America's best transit systems. Uh, they reimagined it. They basically took the existing buses they had, the existing system they had, and they said, we need to do better. And instead of having all these weird routes with weird schedules, they put everything on like circulators. So one bus goes around the city, the next bus goes around the city, and a whole bunch of just go in laterals like this. And you can just stand there, and in five minutes, a bus will come, and you get on it, and you go, and then you get off here and go, and you can get to anywhere you want without thinking on a very high-frequency bus. What they did is they shifted their system from doing crappy service everywhere to doing really great service in most, you know, in most places. And the reality is, is that while a tiny percentage of places experience a decrease in service, the vast majority of the city increased massively in their service level. And that helps the poor, but it also helps everybody else. And by making that a system for everybody, it builds neighborhood strength and resilience, and it makes the system not subject to future cuts the next time there's an economic downturn. Because now it's a system for everybody. Thank you so much. Good question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah.